I'm Blythe Hamer. I'm executive director of the Kellogg Finance Network. Uh, we're focused on supporting finance alums uh, from Kellogg by offering opportunities to network and connect both uh, professionally and personally. I am today so pleased to welcome Harry Kramer. Uh, he is a co-chair of the Kellogg Finance Network. Um, perhaps more importantly, he's also a professor of the year at Kellogg. He's the former CEO of Baxter International, and he's an executive partner at Madison Dearborn, which is one of the largest PE firms in the US. Um, he's gonna be sharing insights about his latest book, Year 168, Finding Purpose and Satisfaction in a Values-Based Life. I have read it. Um, it's a really important and inspiring book, especially right now. Um, I think when we're all probably examining our values even more than ever. Um, and I also want to point out that actually um, proceeds from the book go right to the One Acre Fund, which is a nonprofit uh, founded by Kellogg alum, Andrew Yan, uh, that uh, focuses on reducing hunger in East Africa by supplying farmers with financing and agriculture training services. And I think Harry told me today that in fact, he's given 990 talks in support of the One Acre Fund, um, which is a real example of leading a values-based life. Um, so before I say, here's Harry, I just wanna say one other thing. Um, Harry wants us to be as interactive as possible. So uh, we're encouraging you to jump in if you have questions. Um, if you feel more comfortable, just type in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on it and either read your question or call on you to ask a question. And with that, here's Harry. Okay, great, great. Okay, well, always great to see some good faces and some former students. So that's all good because a big part of leadership is obviously delegation. So uh, for folks like Ed, if, if I, somebody asks a simple question, I'll take it on. If it's more cerebral, thought-provoking, complex, I'll just delegate it to one of my former students. So I'm, I'm very calm this evening. This will be, this will be just, a, just a lot of fun. And uh, as uh, Blythe mentioned, I, I always prefer uh, a dialogue to a monologue. So I'd encourage you, you know, just jump in. We can talk about some of these topics. I, I, th I think it's much more engaging than just, just listening to me talk. So uh, would, would, love to, uh, would love folks to, to, to do that. Um, and again, if you if you want to type something in, fine. But again, just take yourself off mute or press the uh, press the bar. Now, some some of you I, I know fairly well. I know very well, and uh, and some of you I don't know as well. And I don't know if everybody uh, has had a chance to uh, to meet our our. I shouldn't even say new dean because she's been here now for uh, seven or eight months. But uh, friend, uh, Professor Dean Professor Cornelli is is here, and then also. Uh, a person who's been incredibly helpful as uh, Martin and I and the team continue to uh, to move uh, KFN forward is uh, is Ben Porter, who's up in the uh, up on the screen there as well, uh, and is, is in charge of of, of all, all all alumni relations for all of Kellogg now, uh, as well as development. And he's offered to uh, to help Martin and I and, and the entire team. So Martin, great to uh, great to have you with us as uh, as well. So. A, a little background on, on this for the, so that you I don't know. Uh, talk about being a very fortunate guy. Uh, like, like all of you, I uh, had the, the great, great opportunity to go to, you know, the best business school in the world. That, that, was, that was wonderful. But, but beyond that, uh, when I was a, a student, uh, Don Jacobs uh, was the, uh, in the finance department. And uh, the way I paid my way through Kellogg is I graded all the finance papers. Uh, that was the way I paid my tuition. And then when I was graduating and he became the dean, I said, well, hey, congratulations, you know, I'm out of here, I'm, uh, I'm going to Baxter. And he said, you're not going anywhere because uh, Baxter's in Chicago, I know where you live, so not, you're not going anywhere from the school. So for 24 years, uh, Don would call me every two weeks. It didn't matter what my job was, even when I was the CFO or the CEO, and he'd say, I need you on a panel, I need you to be a guest speaker. Uh, he didn't really ask a lot. And I said, well, hey, if it hadn't been for Kellogg, I'd, I wouldn't have been the CEO of a $12 billion company. And he said, I will never, ever let you forget that. So. Um, it was, I guess, I can't believe now, but I think it was 14 years ago, the day was announced I was leaving Baxter, uh, he called me. He was the Dean Emeritus then, he was almost 80 years old, but as you, many of you know, he taught almost every day until a couple of years before he died at 90. And he said, hey, this is fantastic news, fantastic, you're, you're finally leaving 
uh, Kellogg, finally leaving Baxter uh, because I, I really want you to teach. And I said, Don, you know, you don't mean like have a syllabus grade paper. That's not happening. I, I run companies. And he said, I think you said you do whatever I told you to do. And uh, being one of these fairly deferential guys, uh, I said, yeah, that's fine. He thought I was going to do finance because of my finance background. But as we all know, Kellogg has got brilliant, brilliant uh, finance uh, faculty, now including our dean. So the whole idea that, you know, I would compete with these people, that, that's not happening. And Don, without hesitation, said, all right, so then what, what do you want to do? And I told him, I said, you know, I said, I, I, I have a little bit of a calling. I'd really like to focus on leadership, value, and ethics. And he said, that's fine, uh, but you start in two weeks. So I spent two weeks in the Deering Library, honestly, reading all the articles I was supposed to read when I was a student, but I had a pretty good time at the time, and I didn't get around to reading them all of them. And uh, so I've been doing this uh, focus on, on uh, leadership and running a global company uh, for the, the last 14 years when I'm not at Madison Dearborn, and it's been fantastic. And any of you that have done teaching probably have realized the same thing I have, which is until you can explain something clearly to a bright group of people, you may think you understand it, but, but, but not really. So that worked out great. And then the quick progression was, uh, and I get all the ideas from the students. I, I think it was the third year I was teaching, one of the students said, you know, you really need to write a book. And I said, I don't even write short emails. And this student literally, uh, after he took the class, said, can I take your class again? And I said, you know, are you slow? I mean, you took the class. I don't, I don't have a, a part two. Uh, and he said, no, no, I'm going to uh, audio tape your entire 30 hours. And that literally ended up becoming the, the first book for, from values to action. And it was all literally about, well, how, how do you be a value-based leader? And uh, I, I try to do a lot of these talks for the One Acre Fund in, in Africa. And then about three years after that, one of the students said, all right, well, that's how you're a value-based leader. But how do, you, how do you build a value-based organization? What, what is that all about? And moving from just an individual leader to an organization, and, and that was the second book, uh, which was really be, becoming the best. And I thought, okay, I'm totally done now, until about nine months ago, uh, the publisher called and said, hey, you know, you've done so many talks. Every time you do these talks, people buy the books, so that's, that's good for you, it's good for us. You know, what are the students asking now? And I realized that the major thing that students and executives, I think, have been asking is, okay, that's all great, but how do you, how do you live a value-based life? How do you live a value-based life? And uh, I thought I would take a couple of years to do that, and they said, hey, if you can finish it by March, uh, we'll make a very big uh, donation to the One Acre Fund. So that's all I needed to hear. So uh, I, I recently finished it, and uh, our dean was uh, nice enough to write an endorsement, so I'm, I'm definitely ind indebted to her. And, and the whole focus really then is, all right, uh, you know, how, how do you live a value-based life? And, you know, we've got all the stuff that all of us are doing. We've all got a million things going on. It's nonstop. But I, I think this question of, okay, how, how do you live a value-based life? And I, what I'll do is I'll give, you, I'll give you a little bit of a summary of, of some of the thoughts, but we we'll love, as I said, just to open it up and we can go, we can go deep on, uh, on any one of these. So th this third book, which uh, Blythe showed, literally is called Your 168, and actually, I, I was talking to a CEO this morning, and he said, hey, I, I saw you, but what, what's this 168? And because he didn't know what it was. And I said, well, about only one out of 10 people know that. But I said, when you're having a bad week and you are really, really working like crazy, you know, what, what, how do you feel? And he goes, well, it's, it's like 24-7. It's, it's like and I said, yeah, but being a math major, we multiply that out. Now, if you carry the two 24 times, you usually get 168, right? So everybody get, has 168 hours. That's what you got. And as my students know, I, I try to keep this very, very simple because every one of us, no matter what we're doing, no matter what our profile, whatever, you got 168 hours. And I often tease people because if you, if you say to some, hey, Ben, you know, can you help me out with this? And Ben would, ben would never do this. But Ben would say, well, you know, Harry, I, I, I don't have the time. I'm always reminding people, we all have time. We, we've all got 168 hours. It, it may not rank high enough in your priorities, and that's okay, uh, but you might as well admit that because you, you have 168 hours. And I think the whole question really is, how do you figure out how you really want to spend that time? And, and everybody on this call uh, you know, has, has got a million things going on. And because we're Kellogg folks and we're always willing to go faster and faster, a really good question, and it's a very serious question that I think it's great for all of us to think about is this. Have we confused activity and productivity, right? You know, Ed, I mean, we're very, very active. It's amazing how active we are, right? And, uh, you know, we can multitask and we got all these devices, you know, Blackberries, Blueberries, iPhones, iPads, you know, we can go faster and faster, but 
have we confused activity and productivity? Or are we moving so fast, we have no idea how productive we are. That would take precious time we don't have. Let's keep going. And, and I concluded a long time ago that the real secret, the real secret to people that are really value-based, I think, is that they take the time to self-reflect. They take the time to self-reflect, which for me basically means you take a small amount of time. Now, again, we're all busy. You know, you can't do it a lot, but you take a small amount of time and you sit down, you get quiet, you find a quiet place, you take a walk, if the, you're in New York, Central Park or whatever, and you ask yourself a couple of fairly basic questions, right? And they're all in the book, but the kind of questions I think people need to ask themselves are questions like the following. What are my values? What's my purpose, right? No kidding around what really matters. And this is not an advertising campaign. It's not an interview. You know, it's yourself, maybe you and your, um, your, you know, your special person, your, your whatever. Uh, you're, you're taking the time to really think that through. And very often when I talk to CEOs about this, they'll say, well, sounds great. Sounds super. But, you know, the problem is I, I don't have the time. And I just ask the question, is it we don't have the time? Or very honestly, is it something we really don't want to do? Because that, it could get a little sensitive, right? If we're honest, it could be, there could be a pretty big difference between what we say is important and what we're actually doing. And that, that, that may be a little uncomfortable. We, we, we really may not want to go there, okay? But I think people that are leaders will, will take a little bit of that time, right? We're willing to challenge ourselves. That, that's what leaders do. And I think by doing that, it really does help you put things into perspective. Because if you think about what's going on and you think about all the things that you're doing, I think the ability to put things into perspective becomes very important, right? Um, you know, when I mentioned to folks, you know, what are all the things you're trying to do in your life? And uh, maybe show of hands, how many of you have heard of this concept? I hear this one almost every day, it seems, uh, work-life balance, a little show of hands. How many of you heard of this work-life balance thing? I always find it to be one of the most fascinating topics because maybe it's my math background. I always say it real slow, right? Work, life, balance, right? You're either working or you're living, right? And some of you that I'm looking on the screen are working enough. If that's not part of living, that could be a problem, right? So I stopped talking about work-life balance about 20 years ago. I spend a lot of time trying to get people to think about life balance, life balance. And it's very interesting. If I asked each of you to take the time to talk about what does that mean? What does it mean to you? What does that really mean? Hey, hey, our careers are important. Our jobs are important. You know, I'll never take away the fact we got to get the job done. But I asked people, how do you think about life balance? And when I was interviewing several hundred people, it was very interesting. Most people would talk about what mattered to them in terms of buckets, right? They'd say, well, you know, one of my buckets is clearly my career. Another one is family. Another one for some people may be your spirituality, maybe a little bit your health, you know, a little exercise, a little sleep, some people a little bit of fun. And hopefully as, as Kellogg folks, you know, when we say um, um, low ego, high impact, you know, maybe there's a little bit of we realize we're here for a blink of an eye and maybe we have a moral obligation to make the world a better place, right? Um, but when you think about all those things, how much of your time are you gonna spend on each one of those? And that's where I think you need to take the time to think about how, how do you spend this 168 hours? Um, and the exercise that I, I have students do, and by the way, I'll mention this to all of you, but here's a warning. Do not attempt this exercise. Do not attempt this exercise unless you're in a really good mood, right? You want to be in a really good mood before you do this because the very simple exercise is the first column is what your goal would be as to what percentage of your time would you think about on, on each of those buckets. The second one is current reality, right? And I've never met the person, and maybe it's Blythe who says, now, there's an amazing coincidence. My, my, uh, my goal lines up with exactly where I'm spending my time. I, I haven't met that person yet. But by, by taking a little bit of time to think about that, I, I think it really helps you put things into perspective. And when I mention this to students, uh, I, I always say one of the rules, by the way, when you look at those six buckets, the sum of the percentages, by the way, uh, cannot exceed 100%. Now, you'd say, well, that, that's, that's sort of obvious. Well, Think about bosses you've had in your past that'll literally say, well, uh, Harry, I need 110% from you. I never really understood what that meant, right? We're gonna give it 100%, but as a math guy, I don't know how you have more than 100% of a pie. I, I, I haven't figured out how you do that. And this whole idea of being self-reflective in my mind enables you, literally enables you, you with your significant other, your family, whatever matters, to start to think about how, how, you're, how you're gonna lay this out. And I think 
one of the interesting things I get, maybe you get this either yourself or, or some from of your friends, there's always this perspective of, um, Harry, Harry, I'm having trouble balancing things. I'm really having trouble balancing things. My observation, because remember, I always say no answers but opinions. My, my observation, my opinion is most people that are having trouble balancing their lives have not been self-reflective enough to figure out what they're trying to balance, right? Because if you haven't figured out what you're trying to balance, how could you possibly balance it? So the, the whole idea in my mind is setting the framework of, of being self-reflective and thinking about what, what that means to you, right? So I, I try to lay that out. And by the way, one of the big advantages, one of the very big advantages of being self-reflective is it minimizes the surprise, right? In fact, the second chapter of this book is literally called, Why Are You Surprised, right? And here, here's the thought process that may surprise you. And you can try this. Any of you uh, sometime in the next couple of days are going to run into somebody who is literally going to say to you, hey, you know, Martin, uh, you know, I'm really surprised. Now, what you want to do is you just want to say, oh, well, oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. Well, why, why are you surprised? They will tell you why they're surprised. And I'm relatively confident that you're going to say to yourself, I'm surprised you're surprised. See, because if you're self-reflective, there's not that many things to be surprised by, right? Every one of us on this call, sooner or later, okay, didn't get the job we wanted, didn't get the promotion we wanted. You know, somebody we care about deeply passes away and dies. It's very, very unfortunate. But, but it shouldn't be a surprise, right? So the example I, I often use is uh, I'm at, out at O'Hare Airport. I run into a former student, you know, uh, you know, Mary, how are you doing? Well, Professor Kramer, no, Harry, Harry, I'm just really surprised. Mary, what are you surprised by? Well, I now have two young daughters. I have no relationship with my two daughters. I'm just really surprised. Well, Mary, do you spend time with your two daughters? No, I don't spend any time with them at all. Oh, okay. Now you don't say this, but you say to yourself, I'm kind of surprised you're surprised, right? And so this whole concept of, it, it truly, truly, truly minimizes a surprise. Now, if you think about, hey, I, I'd really like to avoid the surprise. Here's the, as, as my students know, I try to keep these very simple concepts. So when I think about what it means to achieve or try to pursue life balance, and by the way, when I was writing this, I realized nobody, I haven't met the person yet who actually achieves life balance, but I almost think of it as this this straight line, right? And in fact, if I use the analogy for those of us in Chicago and New York, it's sort of like if, if I literally had pure life balance, I could get on, I think it's 80, I could go from Chicago to New York and that's life balance. But the way I started to think about this is you never stay on Route 80, right? You're, you always get off at an exit ramp, right? You get off an exit ramp, maybe you're you know, going to the restroom, you're getting dinner, you're staying at a hotel. And the way I, the beauty of self-reflection in my mind is you realize you've gotten off. You realize you've gotten off okay, take a break, whatever, but now are you going to get back on? So if, if, you, if you looked at this, you'd say to yourself, all right, you're off it, but are, is it almost like a little sine wave where you actually stay pretty close to it and you know you're off it? I mean, use any example, right? You're trying to spend time with the family, you're trying to exercise, but all of a sudden, you know, Ed is working on a deal and it's, hey, you know what, for the next week, next week, I got to be at the office, you know, 120 hours because we got to get this deal done. But do you know that's happening? Do you know that this is going to be an exception and that immediately after that week, you'll start to get yourself in, 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 in check? And the way I describe it in the book, I say, here's what happens to a lot of people, right? I'm going from Chicago to New York. I get off an exit ramp, all right? But because I'm not really thinking and I'm not self-reflecting, all of a sudden I see the sign for entering Atlanta, okay? I, I have gotten so far off the track that the way I think about it is, you know, you, you basically hit the wall. And uh, Carter Cast, one of uh, my fellow professors and just a phenomenal guy, talks about derailers and talks about what happens when you don't know. And we all know these people, right? These are the folks who they just lost track of what was going on, right? They gained 40 pounds. They're not sleeping. They got a heart problem. Uh, they have no relationship with their children. Um, and, and this whole idea of, boy, if you hit the wall, do you know now at least finally you've hit the wall? Do you have somebody who loves and cares you about enough to say, hey, I better, I better get close to the, close to back, back on track again, or, you know, th this is going to imp impact my life in, in, in a major way. So this whole idea of self-reflection helps you. You are going to occasionally get off balance, but do you know you're off balance and, and can figure out a way to get back on? And one of the things then when I was talking to Carter and, and, a, and a bunch of other folks and some folks I went to Kellogg with, we literally started to think about, all right, well, what do, what do you do to stay closer to that, that pursuit of life balance? What, what do you do? 
But one of the things you got to do is you have to surround yourself with some people and hopefully each one of us has them. Uh, you have to have a few folks, maybe a partner, maybe a friend, maybe a colleague, somebody you work with who literally can help make sure, you know, you're, you're living in the real world, right? As, as Julie will often say to me, Harry, uh, left to your own devices, you could convince yourself of anything. Do you want to know what I think? Well, at least in my relationship, the answer to that is always yes. Even if I, even if I don't think it's yes, it's better be yes, okay? Uh, and finding some people like that, I think, becomes in, in, incredibly important. Okay, so, you know, I, I use the example, if, uh, if I'm working with Mark, and I realize, hey, this is a good guy, he's got good values, I got a pretty good relationship, I I'm going to go to lunch with Mark, and I'm going to say, hey, Mark, you know what, here's some things that are really important to me, Here here's some things that really matter. And the beauty of that, if you've got a good relationship, and the guy can be real open with you, look at the range of, of reactions I could get from Mark, right? I'll give it to you from the good side to the bad side. The good side is, Mark literally says, hey, Harry, you know, stop for a minute. Hey, based on your, based on your actions that I see day to day, I could have guessed what your values are. I mean, you know, it's, it's perfectly in sync. Now, the other side's a little scarier, right? This is where Mark says, you know, wow. I mean, based, based on your actions, I'm amazed you're deluded enough to think those are your values. You're, you're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Right. Um, so, so and we all fool can fool ourselves. So, so having people like that and helping make sure that happens, I think becomes very, very important. And then I realized, okay, well, we, we're all human. We know this can happen. You know, what, what can we do to sort of help this process? And what a bunch of folks started to say to me was, well, Harry, you know what I think it is. A lot of this is about building really good habits, building good habits. And I tried to go through talking to a lot of people uh, that have developed habits, what works well and what doesn't work well, all right? And I'm sure many of us have either seen this happening or, or dealt with people that it has. The typical thing is people literally will say, all right, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose 30 pounds. I'm going to lose 30 pounds. And I, I was talking to uh, one, of, uh, one of my uh, colleagues that, that runs a very, very large uh, um, center for, um, you know, life fitness type of thing. And uh, he said something like 80% of the people who sign up in January uh, for this is, is sort of a, a New Year's resolution, 80% of them drop out by the end of February. And you think about it because what goes on often is people set a, a goal that's fairly unrealistic, right? It'd be a little bit like somebody, they don't exercise, they talk, talk to the doctor, they say, hey, you know, you really need to get your act together. And the guy literally guy buys a pair of sneakers and says, you know what? I'm going to start running. Oh, here's a coincidence. You know, the, uh, the marathon in Chicago is in October. I'm going for it. Now, here's a guy who's never walked a block, okay, who now assumes he's going to run a marathon in a couple months. I don't think so, right? Uh, rather than saying, hey, what, what's the goal here? Well, the goal is to get healthy. So maybe I'll start taking a walk. Maybe I'll walk a half a mile. Uh, maybe I'll walk a mile. Maybe I'll gradually start to run. Hey, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, I could do like a, uh, a, a 5k a, a, a year or so from now. So, so setting, setting realistic goals that, that could actually work for you as opposed to doing things that, that, that really don't make sense. And so my, my four favorite words, I, I always tell the students along these lines, I think about four things that, that helped me in my job, in my family and everything else. So here we go. Discipline, focus, consistency, and, and credibility right? I, I kind of think of it very simple. If, if I'm not disciplined, if I'm not focused, and I don't do it consistently, then there's no way I'm going to establish any credibility. But if I can be disciplined and focused and do it consistently, then I, I start to establish a little credibility with myself, uh, and then I can be, have, feel like I'm developing credibility with, with, with other people. So that, in my mind, then, uh, really requires you to start to be planful, and I, I, I talk about in the book, and I talk to a lot of people that think about planning in, in a lot of different ways. And what I've realized is a lot of the people who really achieve uh, a life balance uh, and really are living a value-based life, they're very planful people. They really think through what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and, and they hold themselves accountable for that. Um, and they, got, they have people that surround them that help them do that. And a, a good example of this discipline piece and I'm sure this has happened to either you or, or people that you know, but very often somebody will come up to me and they'll say, well, uh, I've got to start exercising. I'm going to start exercising. Now, you look at the person, you'd say, yeah, really, it'd be a good idea if they started exercising. You don't say that, but you kind of think that. Um, and then they say, that's what we're going to do. Well, then you run into the person like two months later, 
and you can tell they probably haven't. And they'll say, one guy literally said to me, well, Harry, I haven't been able to get started much, but you'll understand that. And I said, what, why is that? Well, Harry, um, because uh, I'm traveling like 50% of the time. And by the way, when I get to a hotel, uh, you know, the fitness center is closed at nine o'clock. And in a very nice way, I said, okay, well, you do whatever you think. I said, I travel at least 50, 60% of the time. But the rule that I established at Baxter 30 some years ago was I don't stay in a hotel ever that doesn't have a 24 hour gym. Or I've worked out a deal with the front clerk that he'll give me the key because if you're having a dinner or whatever, I may not get to the fitness center till 11, right? Now, again, this is the beauty of everybody's gonna be different. If, it's, if it doesn't matter to you and it's not something you're too worried about, well then, then don't worry about it. But if it's something you say you wanna do, you really wanna do it and you don't do it, well then you gotta ask yourself, why, why did you say it was important, right? That, and that's why I always tell the students, I'm not telling anybody what to do. In fact, I take the extreme position of if I've got a student or, or an executive and they say, hey, you know what? The job is the most important thing to me. That's the most important. And if that means I have to sacrifice my family, my health, that's what I want to do. Now, some of us would say, oh, geez, I don't think I'd want to do that. But the beauty of that, the beauty of that for that person is that they won't be surprised. See, I'm all about minimizing the surprise. I'm all about minimizing the surprise. And therefore, when I talk about being planful, um, and I mean very, very planful, I'll, I literally will say, you know, we, everybody does it differently, but I've always taken the tack that I sort of always know what I'm doing the next 360 days. So when I'm on an airplane, of course, not on now, I will literally take the time to go through, yes, I have this paper uh, spiral pad with 360 pages, I'm still at that, that vintage, uh, but I will literally go through what I'm doing uh, for the next 360 days. And that helps me stay pretty planful. But then I'll run into some people and one student said, boy, oh boy, you know, that doesn't work for me. I mean, I gotta have some spontaneity. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't be in this uh, 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 jacket here of, uh, you know, not knowing, not having any flexibility. And to try to prove the point, the chapter literally is called being planful and uh, have spontaneity. And people say, well, how, how could that be? And any of you that are really planful, if you're not planful, you're gonna disagree with this. So when we open this up, you can challenge this. But it literally turns out a surprise to some that the more planful you are, the more spontaneity that you can have because you've got multiple degrees of freedom, right? So the example I usually give, and no show of hands, but there were some people on this screen, I know when you were in college or graduate school and you had to write that 10 page paper and you had two weeks to do it, about that night before, that famous night before, you know, Ben walks in with, you know, uh, 15 textbooks because he's going he's gonna to jot that whole thing out that night. Well, if I walk into his room that night and say, hey, you're not going to believe this, but I got a bunch of free tickets, uh, you know, to the bar downtown, unlimited, uh, unlimited beers, well, he can't come because he's got no degree of freedom, right? As opposed to creating the flexibility. And nobody has taken me up on what I've just said, but I'm going to offer this again. Yes, I do know what I'm doing the next 360 days. I, I know that. But if, if somebody like Rick or David calls me tonight and says, you're not going to believe this, but I have two extra tickets for Bruce Springsteen next Thursday night, I will be there. And in fact, it doesn't even matter what city it's in. I, I will be there because I'll, I will literally move some things around because if you're planful, you, can, you have the ability to do that. But if you're not planful, everything is at the last minute. And, and you're kind of running around like, like a chicken with your head cut off. So this whole idea of you're going to be planful, but, but you're going to create as much flexibility, you know, given, given what's going on. Or I always tease with five children, I'm either flexible or I'd be dead. I, I can tell you that one right now. So that's a little bit of this, of this whole process of being, being reflective, trying to minimize the surprise, avoiding hitting the wall, trying to develop really good habits, and being planful, but at the same time, you're, you're trying to be as flexible as you can. Um, and then what I try to do throughout the rest of the book is to say, all right, let's break out these, these six buckets. Let's really think through what do I really need to do to be more productive with my career, with my family, with my spirituality, with my health, with having fun and, and having a good time. Um, and then realizing, you know, hey, I am here for a blink of an eye. Uh, and, I, and I really feel like I, I make a difference in the world. So um, that's a summary. Uh, I was doing this for, uh, for Aeon uh, a week or so ago, and I did sort of the three-hour version. But I told Blythe that uh, knowing this group, I, I would try to keep this to about a half an hour.
which is exactly what I did. Uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy to either give you examples, and I can, we can either talk about things that I mentioned already, or we can, we can take this any way that, uh, any way that folks would, uh, would be like or, 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 uh, or, or be helpful. Um, I, so, think, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. So any, so any Harry, questions, any thoughts? Ben? Harry, uh, what, what I love best about the book were sort of like Harry's life tips and like a window into how you conduct things. And really interesting how you said you like to have these brief five-minute phone conversations as opposed to saving up for a two-hour conversation. And I, I, I've, been, I've been the recipient of that, and, and now the book helped me appreciate. So can you talk about some of those decisions, or you said you don't like to do email. Can you talk about that? Sure. So uh, I, I always say, and Ben and I have been spending a lot of time together, um, I, um, I always say opinions because people are going to do it very differently. But what, one of the conversations that Ben and I got into, and we got a lot of busy people on, on this call, what I realized is very often, in fact, Dean and I have talked about this as well, uh, we've all got so much to do. There's an amazing amount of things to do. And for a lot of executives, you get to, you get to the office, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning and, and then the secretary or somebody gives you a schedule and here's the next 12 hours. And when you're thinking about all the things you wanted to do, the overlap of what somebody told you you've got to do and what you really feel like you need to get done is sometimes almost the null set. And Ben and I were talking about this and he said, well, hey, Harry, when you're, you know, when you're running Baxter, running international, being the CFO, how, how, did, you, how did you look at that? And I, what I will say is maybe some of you have done this. But what I realized was it's nice to have an assistant, nice to have somebody who, who can tell you who's called. But I had to practice, believe it or not, uh, even when I was the CEO of Baxter, nobody put anything on my calendar ever without me knowing it. And what I used to do is I used to call whatever I was in the world because I was out of the country every other week because, you know, Baxter, we had a $12 billion company, 70% of our sales, 80% of our earnings was outside the United States. So I was traveling a lot, but I would literally call my secretary every two hours, every two and a half hours. And I'd say, hey, Kathy, what's going on? And she'd say, well, uh, here, there's a list of uh, nine people that, that, that want to set up a meeting with you. I said, well, let's go through them. Okay. Uh, you know, Gail, uh, you know what? G Gail can talk to, to Joe. Uh, ben, uh, you know what? Uh, uh, what does he need? Well, he needs an hour with you. I'll tell you what, give me his phone number. I'll call Ben in the next 10 minutes. Because what's very interesting is if you say, hey, we'll set up a half an hour a week from now. Well, first of all, when somebody comes to your office, it's hard to have a meeting for a half an hour, right? You want to be cordial. You want to be friendly. How's the weather? How are the kids? But interestingly enough, Ben's thinking it may take a week for me to get to him. But when Ben will call, I'll call him back within an hour. Hey, Ben, what do you need? And I realized either I know what he may need or I know somebody who, and in my mind, the best executives, and again, I'm, I'm much older than everybody on this line, but for me, I almost think about being an executive as one of those, the old switchboard things, right? You're a switchboard. It's sort of like, okay, here's Martin. Martin's got that. Okay, you know, plug it in with Karn. I'm just constantly, and I, what I realized was the, the faster I can get back to people, people always say, geez, you know, Harry, you get four or 500 emails a day. Every time I get an email, I get a response. Well, that's because that's what I do. I don't meet with people very often. And when I meet with them, it's for a very short period of time, very short period of time. Um, and what I, what I realize also, Ben, is that uh, I talk a lot faster than I type. That's pretty obvious, okay? I mean, I was born in Queens, so what, what do you expect, right? So the reality, the reality of life, Ben, is uh, if I get a long email from you, okay, and I do this with students, by the way, this, this is a shock to students, Ed may remember this, if I get an email at 1230 in the morning from somebody saying, you know, I'm trying to decide, do I go to work for McKinsey or Bain? And I look at it, it came in at 1230, it's 1231, okay, they must be up, they just left me an email, I will call them, okay, I will call them, because they can't tell me they're sleeping, and then we can have that discussion in five minutes. So on an average day, Ben, I probably talk to at least 30, 40 people every, every day. Okay. People say, where do you find the time? I got a lot of time because I, I, I try not to spend a lot of time uh, in, in meetings. All right. Uh, and what I really found is, is while somebody's saying, oh, you don't meet with me a lot. Wait a minute. If I need something from Harry, he'll get back to me right away. He'll get back to me right away. Um, so I, I find, I find managing your own calendar, Ben, um, and it is, an, is, an, is incredibly helpful because you end up with, by the way, a lot of really conscientious people who want to help you and, and they can suck up a lot of time. 
an amazing amount of time that, that, you, that you don't have, you know? I mean, I, I mean, I can just think of, of our Dean. She has got so many things going on right now. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just got to be a blizzard what this lady's got going, right? I mean, we got issues and challenges with executive education. We got students who want to know why they're not getting a refund. You know, we got, I mean, the woman has got at least 50 things going on. What she doesn't need is somebody setting up a whole lot of meetings, okay? What's the issue, okay? What's the issue? And, and who can help me out? And how fast can I get an answer? Um, and I, because you know, people sort of tease me right now, uh, Ben, they'll say, well, let me just think about this a minute. You're, you are, you're on 10 boards. You're the chairman of three companies. You teach more classes than just about any professor because you teach the full-time, the part-time, the executive MBA, and the Allen Center in Chicago, Miami, uh, Miami and Hong Kong. Uh, and you got five kids. Well, the reality of it is, I don't meet with a lot of people. I, I, I just don't. Because uh, most people are looking for somebody to figure out how to solve the problem. So if I'm going to talk with you, Ben, and you and I've done this a lot, and you're you're great at this. Hey, what's the issue? And you'll say to me, Hey, Harry, do you know somebody who could do this? You know what? I got three people you you could talk to. Um, and uh, you know, because you've only got you've only got 168 hours, and uh, you have to figure out how you're going to do that, and, and and you time it. So I know we're on this call between 5:30 and 6:30. Okay. I got my running shoes right here because as soon as I get the 5:30, uh, I'm going to run between 5:30 and 6:30 along the lake because you know I'm not taking uh, I'm not going to have dinner till seven, um, and then that's 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 the, what I find Ben of being helpful of just managing your own calendar and knowing where you're spending your time because it's amazing to me how people don't really know where they're spending their time. Um, does that make sense, Ben? Yeah, and, and it's great as hair. You always seem to have time, so clearly you've got to figure it figured out. I don't have much to do, Ben. I, that's why you can always call me, pal. You, you know, you tell me. I'll tell you this much, Martin. I have to give the guy credit to bear some. He has done an amazing job with Blythe and 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 moving the KFN forward. Okay, and I got to tell you, if I get an email or a text from Martin or Blythe, okay, you know, that's that's kind of a high priority for me because I I, I really believe the team in New York has done an unbelievable job. It's the only one that I know of that's created something like this that's gonna have long-term value. And everybody's aware of it. I mean, just the fact that Francesca has said to me at least 10 times, hey, Harry, what, what can I be doing? What can I and my team be doing to be supportive of, of, of KFN and, and moving this thing forward and making it even better in, in the future? So. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> From me, oh. yes. I mean, Francesca, you have any any thoughts on this? Because I mean, you right now, when I think of all the CEOs I'm working with, whatever you are, you right now are probably the busiest one uh, in terms of what you got going. Just given what's happening in higher education and Northwestern and our international students and visas, and you know, any any uh, any any thoughts you you'd like to share with the team here? So I I don't think I'm busier than you, but yes, I am busy and. Uh, I mean, the difficulties there are, I think there are more constituents, right? It's the alumni, it's the students, it's the staff, but even the alumni, occasionally, I t you know, there's various group of students and programs that are completely, uh, I, I did find during the crisis, it was worth my time. It was not the call because it's group, but I have a lot, a lot of virtual town hall. And, and, and it was way more effective. And, and actually Harry did several with me, way more of, it was the equivalent of your uh, five minutes call, if you want, with big constituencies. I, I found that was uh, very effective, much more effective than emails. At the beginning, I spent entire weekend trying to draft a message or email to let say the student, and then I would throw it away because it didn't really work, it didn't really resonate. And now I've decided that exactly is so much better. I just go in front and I can move my hands being Italian. <laughs> I can't move the hands in an email. So it's extremely difficult for me. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so, so that is, I, I think my, I was thinking what you were saying, I think my virtual town hall to group of people constantly, constantly updating have been the equivalent of your, uh, of your, of your phone calls. Yeah so much more effective than an email where you don't know when at the beginning i sent email turned out some line in the email ended up and being misunderstood or being misinterpreted 
Well, with a virtual phone call, I would have questions immediately and I could be really upfront about yeah. what they want. Well, and and that, that makes so much sense, Ben, and it ties back to what you mentioned earlier because the same thing happened to me. When I was at Baxter in lower level positions, it's like, I'm going to send an email. Well, it's going to get translated into different, different languages. People are going to see different things or whatever. Uh, and then I started doing a deal where every two weeks – um, I would do these town halls. It was basically called Ask Harry. Uh, and I'd get on these things and I would literally say, hey, here's some things that are going on because when you're, when you're, when you're talking, and whether it's on a video like this or whatever, people can actually relate to you. They can relate to it. And then if you say something and people can dial in and say, wait, wait, what did you mean by that? Oh, wait, wow, here's what I meant. But, but once it's on paper and it gets circulated, you, know, you're, you just can't please everybody. And a chance of it getting misunderstood is, is, is remarkable. So I, I try to make sure that I do as, as, much, uh, as, as much talking as I can and the least amount of, uh, of writing as I can, which is why it's sort of ironic that I end up with three, three books, but that's a whole other story. Blythe. I have a question from uh, John Dom. Oh, perfect. Uh, he asks, isn't some of this about determining what is most important? Absolutely, absolutely, um, yes. And, and it's gonna be different for each person, but, but John, John's absolutely right, because this ability to take some time, and, and again, uh, sometimes folks will ask, can you give an example? I'll, I'll give an example that I've shared with, with the students. I don't mean just, oh, I'll think about it. I mean literally taking the time, Blythe, to sit down and get off by yourself, significant other, and ask yourself, you know, what really is most important? How important, whatever happens to me, how important is your spouse? How important is your family? How important is your spirituality or your religion? It, 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 and if it isn't important, okay, but what really matters? And what I find remarkable, Blythe, and I, I talk about this in the writing, is that there's a lot of people that literally just haven't taken the time to figure that out. And I'm sure you people have seen this. Like The example I, I use is that there was one senior executive I worked with, and uh, he said, Harry, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. I said, okay, I'll call him Joe. Joe, what's the story? He says, well, uh, you know, I, I'm having marital issues. Uh, I have problems with my children. I'd really love to talk to you. And I said, well, look, I, I have no answer. No, Harry, you have no answers, but I'd love to at least talk to you. I said, hey, Joe, I'll do anything for you. Hey, you live close by. Hey, Saturday, why don't you stop by? We can sit on the back porch and we can talk about it. He said, well, Saturday doesn't work. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm golfing on Saturday. I said, all right, well, hey, Sunday after church, do you want to swing by? Well, I, I, I'm golfing on Sunday. All right. Now, being the math guy, I think to myself, well, I think it takes five hours to golf, right? So twice, that's 10 hours. Now, here's how open I am. If that's more important to you, and you've, and you've when, when uh, John says what matters, if that really is more important to you, I'm not going to judge it shouldn't be, but that's 10 hours, and you're calling me because you have no relationship with your family. So do you know where you're spending your time? Have you thought about where you're spending your time? Um, and, uh, you know, what I, the habit that I developed uh, a long time ago that my, my students are aware of is uh, I got in the habit of I spend 15 minutes a night every night doing a, a personal self-examination at the end of every night. It's 15 minutes and uh, mine, mine goes like this. There's a, something that I, I, I picked up in a, uh, uh, in a Jesuit retreat I went to, a three-day silent retreat. M mine goes like this. What did I say I was going to do today? What did I actually do? What am I proud of? What am I not proud of? How did I lead people? How did I follow people? If I lived today over again, what would I have done differently? And then the last one for me is if I have tomorrow, being fully well aware that sooner or later I won't, but if I do have tomorrow and I'm a learning person, based on what I learned today, how will I operate differently tomorrow? You know, as a leader, as, as a spouse, as a father, as a son, what, you know, whatever, whatever has, has, has mean to you in your life. Um, and people say, well, do you do that every day? I do that every day, all right? Uh, and the reason I do it is everybody on this screen, if we're out at a party together till one in the morning, most of you will probably brush your teeth before you go to bed because you got in that habit when you were two or three years old. So for me, this is, this is just a habit, all right? And people say, well, do, do, you, uh, do you have to write it down? I have to write it down because if I don't write it down, am I self-reflecting or am I just daydreaming? Particularly if I've had a couple glasses of wine, I, 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 make, I may get a little confused, right? So it just makes it a little bit more, more, more concrete for me. Uh, now, am I expecting everybody to do that every day? No, but I would say uh, I try something, you know, whether some of you are going for walks or a jog or, 
you, you have prayers or meditation, whatever, finding a way, finding a way to figure out how to separate out this activity and productivity uh, and figuring out what, what, really, what really matters to you. Um, and as I said earlier, it, it minimizes a surprise. It truly minimizes a surprise. What else? Yes, Phil. You're on mute, Phil. Got it. Okay. So if you're trying to optimize your 168, I find one of the biggest issues that I have at least is just, just to just say no, right? You know, we've all built up networks over time and yeah. whether it's people from the various firms we've worked at or the communities we're in or, or students from Kellogg and Northwestern that are reaching out because of the firms you're at and you can only do yeah. so. So how do you think about the, the, the best way to, prioritize and just say no to those things that you'd love to be able to do in order to optimize that 168. Yeah. So Phil, you know, great one, Phil, great one. And uh, uh, great you brought it up because it's, I'll tell you, you have to always be honest and understand your faults. One of my major faults is I do have a hard time saying no. Now, because I'm, I'm so focused on this 168, the way I've done that one, and you can argue, is this a good idea or bad idea, Phil? Um, I will call everybody and then I'll direct them to somebody else. So uh, here's the one, Phil, a day does not go by. I get a call from some uh, Kellogg's current student or one, they'll say, hey, would you, be, would you be my mentor, right? And I'll say, whoa, wait a minute, uh, you know what? That, that could be a lot of time, but I'll say, here's the deal. I, I don't have time to be your mentor, Phil, I don't, but here's the deal. You got my mobile number, feel free to call me, and by the way, if you're looking for a certain thing or you're looking for a certain career or whatever, I'll give you two or three names of people that you, that you, could, you could talk to, right? Because what ends up happening is if Ed calls me uh, and says, hey, Harry, could, you know, could I chat with you? Hey, Ed, could I set up some time with you? Hey, Ed, let's talk right now. What do you need? Well, Harry, you know, in my private equity firm in Toronto, uh, I'm trying to think through how could we look at this industry? I, hey, Ed, here's three people that I, I think could really help you out. I, that could really help you out. And Ed says, hey, Harry, really appreciate it. Let me know what I can do. So what ends up happening then, Phil, you call me and say, hey, I'm a student. Could you mentor me? I, Phil, I don't have a lot of time. What are you looking for? Well, I'd really like to learn a little bit more about private equity. Ah, I got a great idea. Here's Ed's number, okay? Uh, and I'll shoot a note. Hey, Ed, would you be willing to? So in other words, in other words it's, interestingly enough, Phil, most people, at least I've realized, if you, if you can give them five, min 10 minutes, and direct them someplace. Uh, that's the way I deal with this idea of, you know, hard for me to say no. Um, but I can, I can, I can get through it pretty quick because um, I try not to, I try not to sign up for long, for long-term commitments. I, I made, I made one long-term commitment to Julie. We're going to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary in a couple of months. That's, that is my only long-term commitment, Phil. That I got going. The rest of them, there, I can, I can be pretty flexible about. Good. That one I can't. That one I can't. That, thanks. Yeah, that's a great question, though, Phil. We deal with it all the time. Anybody else? And it, and it can be some of the folks who, even we don't see their faces here, uh, they're, just, they're just there, I think. Uh, any any uh, thoughts on any of this stuff? I mean, I have a question. I have a question because, Harry, you go on these three-day retreats, and you are literally silent for three days every year. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm interested because self-reflection is not an easy thing. No. So to say, you know, self-reflection is the most important thing, I, I certainly agree with. I guess I'm looking for, um, I mean, I've even thought now based on your experience about going away on a three-day retreat to see if, if that can help further my understanding of myself. Yeah, so, um, well, and most people who do not know me well, I would say, uh, you, Harry, um, uh, being silent for, for three days, I can't even imagine it because you can't seem to be quiet for like three minutes. How, how, how could that possibly be? Uh, and I, I, in the book, I actually mentioned that the quick story, which some of you some of you already heard this, but the, the quick story of how this all happened, Blythe, was um, when I, was, I went to a small college in Wisconsin, Lawrence University, small liberal arts, that's where I was a math major. And when I was a senior, I met this young a woman who was a freshman. In fact, I admit this now, Blythe, it was her first day of school as a freshman, and, I, and I'm a senior because I had the best job. I, I ran the checkout desk at the library. You, you couldn't take a book out if, if I didn't know who you were. It was an amazing job, Blythe. It was an amazing job. So, so I, I start dating this gal, but I'm a senior and I'm graduating early, so I was only there for a, a month or two overlap, and I came down to Chicago uh, with uh, Bank of America, and 
I, what I ended up doing, and I tell my five kids, I can't do this now, they can't do this now, but 40 years ago, uh, I used to hitchhike up to Appleton, Wisconsin every other weekend, it was 183 miles. And uh, this worked out great for about three months until I got a call from her father, uh, this very uh, intense fellow from uh, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And he said, hey, I know what's going on, you're dating my daughter, uh, you know, we need to spend time together. And I said, you know, hey, super, you know, calm down in Chicago. He said, no, 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 you, you, you come up to Minnesota. And I didn't know what the whole deal was. When I got up there, he said, I'm thinking I'm going to do a Viking game. He said, no, we're, we're going to go on a retreat together. And I asked the obvious question, you know, what's, what's a retreat? And uh, he said, well, it's going to be hard for you because you can't shut up for three minutes. Uh, it's a silent retreat. You're, you're not going to be talking for three days. And I remember thinking to myself, um, you know, I could be back in Chicago in, in 45 minutes. How much do I like this guy's daughter? But being a finance guy, you know, some cost, I'm already there, you know, I might as well see this thing through. And uh, I went on this thing and they gave you these exercises, Blythe, and they're, you know, when you, when you sit down, the only people who talked was, it was run by the Jesuits. The Jesuits, in fact, I see Jack here, Jack goes, goes on this thing with me. We, we literally, the only person who talks is, is, the, uh, is the Jesuit. You have no talking whatsoever. And they'll, and they'll, when you talk to them, they'll give you an exercise. They'll say, hey, you're flying back home and uh, one fellow told me, he says, and the, fl the plane crashes, what would you have liked to have said to uh, your significant other? Now, if we did that exercise here for five minutes, you jot something down, but you got three days. If, and you have nobody to talk to, there's no devices, there's no nothing. And you know, I'm getting kind of emotional about this and I'm thinking, I'm not even on an airplane, right? Um, and when the thing ended, they said, it shouldn't be a one-time event. You, you should spend at least 15 minutes a day doing a personal self-examination. And so, that's what I've been doing. And uh, the, cra the crazy part of it is, you know, for more than now 30 some years, the first weekend in December, no matter where I am in the world, and I've flown back from Tokyo or you name it, but um, uh, I always show up at this Jesuit retreat house the, for the, um, the, the first weekend in December. I think this year it's the fourth through the seventh. Um, and I've done this for, you know, almost, almost 40 years. Um, and I didn't, and I didn't marry his daughter, by the way. So that all, that all worked out, uh, worked out re reasonably well. And, and the way I would describe this, as crazy as it sounds, for any of you in your, in your organization, Phil, you know, you've got like a strategic plan and then you have an operational plan, right? And that what dawned on me uh, while I was going to Kellogg was, well, why wouldn't you do the same thing as an individual, right? Why don't I spend a couple of days once a year doing a strategic plan of, hey, if I've got a couple more years, what could I do to be a better leader, better professor, uh, you know, better father, whatever? Uh, and then you do your 15-minute check-in. Are you on course or not? And if you're not on course, what do you need to get back on course? So, uh, and, and in fact, it's funny. Uh, the other piece of this, Blythe, is I got asked a lot from people who know me. Well, boy, you know, you were a, uh, you studied mathematics and accounting and a CP. Boy, this, this uh, self-reflection thing sounds a little, a little qualitative. Where, where's the calculus? And he took six semesters. Like, where's the calculus? So, I always remind people that um, what leaders do, particularly if they've got a mathematical background, we put things into equations, right? So to convince myself that everything, everything related to leadership um, starts with self-reflection, Here, here's the three-step uh, mathematical equation. No numbers for you, but it goes like this. Step one, if I'm not self-reflective, is it possible for me to know myself? I would doubt it. Step two, if I don't know myself, is it possible for me to lead myself? I would doubt that. Third step is, if I can't lead myself, is it possible for me to lead others, right? A then B, B then C, C transitive property of equality, algebra one, it, it, it sort of matters, mm -hmm. right? So there's this whole deal in my mind of, you know, how do you live a value-based life? You know, as John said, what really matters? What really matters? And if, if what you're doing is inconsistent with what you say really matters, I think you need to take a real long walk by yourself or with somebody and figure out what, why is there a disconnect? And are the things that I am, I'm, uh, I'm searching for or I'm motivated by, is that consistent with what I, I say really, really matters? And, uh, and a, a lot of us get that life in a lot of different ways. I, I mentioned in the book, I was very fortunate because my father, a uh, very simple fellow, I died a couple of years ago in his 80s, but he, he helped me solve the whole material thing that many of us get caught up in. His, and I don't know where he stole this from, but his whole comment was, he said, have you ever seen a hearse uh, with a coffin in it going to a cemetery uh, with a U-Haul attached to it? And I said, yeah, what, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, Harry, think about it. He said, most people we know, either they must believe 
all this stuff they're accumulating is going with them when they die, or they must think they're living forever. Because if you know those two things aren't happening, what are you doing with all of this stuff, right? And again, it's always fun. Uh, you see all these people collecting right? What are they doing? Well, I'm downsizing. I got to get rid of all this. Well, didn't you realize uh, that, you know, what, what you were doing? In fact, here's, a, here's the last example on this one, Blythe, when I said, you know, uh, uh, don't be surprised. And some of you may have seen this one, but I, I've been getting this one a lot lately from my, some of my, my friends. Here, here's the, the, the insane thing to me that I see happening. You get somebody, they're very successful. They're remarkably successful. Maybe they're a Kellogg grad. They're in their like early 40s. They've really done well, and they decide they're going to build this enormous house, right? And you'll say, well, boy, there's a lot of houses. Are no, no, no. I, I got to do it. And by the way, Harry, I can do it in six or nine months. Wrong. It's three years. It's, a, it's crazy, whatever. But they do it. Okay, that's fine. That part, you kind of walk your way through. But then what I find remarkable is that's all they talk about for three years. Well, then you don't see the person for like eight years. So eight years, this happened to me two days ago. Eight years later, you run into, uh, you know, Jack. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Well, you know, Harry, it's, uh, it's a little tough for us right now. What's that? Well, we got to downsize. We're in a process of downsize and we got to get a smaller house. Jack, why is that? Well, all the children, they just left for college. And of course, what you want to say is, did you not realize eight years ago, all of your children eight years later would be eight years older and they wouldn't be there. And you'd be in this 15,000 square feet by yourself. Is that a surprise? I'm surprised you're surprised, right? So this whole idea, as John said, take the time to figure out what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What, real, what really matters? And I think by taking the time to do that, you're, you're well on your way, I think, to having much more of, of a value-based life. I keep it simple so I don't, I don't confuse myself. Any other, any other last comments here on anything? Any challenges here? Uh, we've got another question, um, again from John. H how to deal with the talkasaurus uh, <laughs> folks who love to talk? Um, what I usually do, well, I, I give you sort of the, um, um, the simple way and then the one that I hate to admit because I hope I don't do this to any of you. Um, it's the second, more, more secret approach. Um, but when I call somebody uh, or somebody gets a hold of me, they'll usually say, Harry, do you have a couple minutes? And I'll, I will literally say, I I've got five minutes. I, I got five minutes, Blythe. You've, you've been a victim of this. I got five minutes, okay? Now, if you didn't hear me on that, here's the secret here. We're all cataloging me very open. Um, I will admit, I have to admit this. Um, if, if you are going on and I'm having a hard time doing it, well, I often say, oh, you know, Blythe, I'm sorry. I got a call coming in another line. Got to take this one. Got to take. Now, was there a call coming in? No, but there was probably a call I needed to make. I um, hope I didn't do that to anybody here, Ben. I hope I didn't do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, because you just, you can't. I mean, you're, you're going to, some people have got, some people, they get a hold of you, and they're going to they're spend a lot more time. But again, I, I find, oh, here's one other secret. Here's one other secret for me. Here's an, here's an important one. Think about people that are really important to you, Blythe. Really good friends, somebody you went to college with, uh, somebody you went to high school, but somebody who's really important. And we haven't talked to them for like months and months, right? What I realize is the longer you wait, the longer the talk has to be. Well, it just takes too long to do. So the reason I try to keep in contact with a lot of people very often is if, if you just do it for five minutes, you know, then you're talking to them, right? You don't have to tell your, 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 your whole life story. So I, I try to keep t touch with several hundred people, but, but they're mostly short discussions. But the longer you wait, the, lo the longer it's going to take. Um, and that's how you lose track of a lot of people. You don't, you don't want to lose track of. So, and by the way, that's one of the wonderful things. I mean, we have all these tragedies going on now and all the, you know, all, all the folks, unfortunately, with uh, the, the, uh, the virus. But the one thing now is, it, this is a good time when you're home to dial up and you can see folks that you have not talked to or seen uh, in, 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 in quite some time. And I've, I've been getting together with groups of, you know, my quad mates from college, getting all on one line, because I, I, some of you guys have used this more often than I, but I'm so old. Remember, I'm the guy who was using a flip phone 12 months ago, right? So the last time I was on a Zoom thing, okay, was you know, 10 years ago when you were on these calls and it was, you know, the thing was looking like this and it was a delay or whatever. And so when, you know, our dean said, you know, hey, we need to move toward this. I was the guy up till three months ago when 
there was a Zoom, you know, when you get the uh, invitation for a Zoom thing, and it was always a telephone number below it, I always call the telephone number. I am not getting involved. Now, I'm doing this like six, you know, six hours a day, but very short, and you see the people, and it makes, it, it makes a lot of sense. So um, I, I, I really believe this technology has moved, you know, so much faster. So when we talk about, you know, we're going to get back to the way it was, I, I think there's going to be a whole new normal going on. And I know that's one of the things our dean is dealing with of what does this mean for for what education is going to be looking like, you know, five, 10 years from now, for sure. What else? Any of anything else? Yeah, Harry, uh, just a quick one. I've read the book twice. Love it. I'm, I'm a big fan. I uh, can quote it uh, chapter and verse, and I highly recommend it for the world, period. Let's leave it at that. Well, thank you, Jack. <laughs> Th thank you. Thank you. Jack Jack has been going on these Jesuit retreats with me for about 10 years, and uh, he's a professor up at the University of, of, of St. Thomas. Um, yeah, thanks again, Harry. No, thank you, Chief. Thank, thanks, thanks, for, th thanks for joining us. So. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll make one other plug for, for, the, for the One Acre Fund, okay? For those of you that aren't aware, um, I get so enthusiastic about this thing. People say, oh, you're overly enthusiastic. But here's what I tease everybody, and maybe you're not aware of this, but to get an honorary doctor's degree from, from Northwestern, I always say, you have to probably be 80 years old and invented a planet or something. I mean, I, you know, Ben may know more of this than I do. But uh, last year at the graduation, um, um, Actually, Andrew Yoon got an honorary doctor's degree. I think the guy's 38 years old. And when we had the Kellogg graduation that afternoon, uh, it turns out, you know, rather than, you know, some, who's going to make the, make the uh, commencement speech, it was, it was uh, Andrew. Um, the, the guy's 30. And this is a guy who literally said, you know, I I'm going to make a difference. And again, you can read about it. And I'd encourage you just to, uh, if you think I'm overly enthusiastic, just look up the One Acre Fund, oneacrefund.org. Um, this is a guy who went over there, as some of you know, when he graduated 11 years ago, uh, and I talked to him every other week. As of two weeks ago, well, of course, he started in Rwanda. He's hired 19,000 Africans, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania. They started in Ethiopia. They've doubled or tripled the crop yield on over 1 million farms that has so far saved the lives of 4 million, 4 million folks. This was a guy, when we talk in class, who's going to deal with all the issues in the world, right? And as Ed, we know the people who are going to deal with them was this famous group of people we refer to as those guys. Some men or women. No, we are those guys. We are those guys. We're so blessed. We're Kellogg people. If we're not going to do something about it, you know, who, who is? And, uh, and by the way, I should send a note to you, Blythe. He just had his second child. He, he married a, a volunteer uh, that was working with him in Rwanda. And uh, they had a little boy two years ago. And just two days ago, he had, he had a little girl. So now he's got, and nice. I told him, how are you doing? He goes, I'm not coming back. He said, we've done these great things. We're 2% of the way. He's got this map of Africa. You'll see when you look at the TED Talk, he's got a couple of red spaces. He goes, we just, we just scratched the surface. Th this guy will eventually win a Nobel Prize. I, I don't think there's any question about, about that. Mm -hmm. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. Any other thoughts? Tell them it's on the TED Talk, too. Tell them to get on there. What's that? Oh, yeah, the TED Talk. Yeah. Andrew Young's TED Talk. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is, if you're going to spend 15 minutes, I know you only got $168, Ben, but 15 minutes, pal, you watch that TED Talk, I'll tell you, it, it, it's, it's remarkable, the, the impact on that. Andrew Young, Y-O-U-N. Remarkable story. Remarkable story. Um, so as, uh, for any of you guys out there, when I say men and, men and women, uh, if you, uh, you know, um, if, you, if you're looking for speakers that uh, can talk about uh, value-based leadership, I'm always willing to do some of them once in a while. All you have to do is make a contribution to the One Acre Fund. That's all, that's all, that's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Um, and the more, the more books people buy, the better for the One Acre Fund. Uh, ben, did you have a comment? Blythe, comment? Yeah, Blythe got the scoop and she produced this event first, but, but we decided that this was going to be so good, we'd try to roll it out to about 65,000 alumni. So hopefully we have your series coming out soon. Uh, that's what, in fact, I was talking to Gail. I was talking to Gail and uh, Bridget the other day. So that's all, that, that's all, that's all good. Because I, I just know that folks that want to go to Kellogg work so hard to, to really, and particularly as you well said, Ben, you know, with this whole virus now and everything going on in our lives uh, and figuring out a way to make sure that, you know, we keep things in some kind of a crazy balance, 
uh, in fact, some of you may have seen this, but I found it remarkable. They said that the average work person working now is working two and a half hours longer every day uh, at, during this virus thing. And when I first read that, I thought, well, wait a minute, we're not traveling, we're not running around, we're not going to like Wardy, we have all this going on. But, but I think we're having a, a, a difficult time. Uh, it says a little bit of Phil's comment, right? In fact, somebody mentioned to me the other day, I said, well, how's this working? And the example they gave, Ben, which I thought was a great example, it'd be a little bit like you calling me this afternoon to send me a text, Harry, can we talk today? And, you know, usually say, hey, ben, you know, Ben, hey, I'll, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Or I'll give you a call on, on, on Saturday or something. But what somebody said was, when you call in the morning, say, can I talk to you? There's almost this feeling of, well, how can you say no? You're home all day. <laughs> how, how can you say no? What, what the hell are you doing? So then you end up putting on so many more things that you, that you can do, and we're, like, and we're like nonstop. And I'm saying, boy, you better get out every day and take a walk, go for a jog, you know, uh, spend some time with the, the children. And that's the, that's the other side benefit of this, right? For some of us, we're spending more time now with having family dinners and lunches than, than, we, than we ever would have before. I was mentioned to some of the group when we were first getting started, Susie, uh, my oldest daughter, Susie, just graduated from Kellogg. I thought, oh, she's out in, in Boston at Wayfair, you know, I'm not going to see her much. Well, she was only out there for two months, and uh, they closed the office for 9,000 people saying, we're closing the office for three months. So she's been home for three months, and the other day she said to me, hey, Dad, I got great news. I said, what's that? They're not opening the office until the end of September. Dad, I'm going to be home for the next four months. You know, at 31, I never thought I'd be able to spend four months with her. This is, this is, a, this is a blessing. Now, amongst all the other issues and all the terrible things going on, you know, there's, uh, there, there's, a, there's another good side of it, which which I think, I think we're fortunate, so. And I would say with that, um, you know, Harry, you're just uh, uh, so special for leading us down the right path and helping us see the, the good. Um, it has been a couple of especially tough weeks in light of especially tough months, but um, I'm just gonna say thank you on behalf of uh, Kellogg and KFN um, and everyone on the phone. Well, thank you, Blythe, and I don't think you get enough uh, attention for what you're trying to do because, you know, rounding all this, as Martin, I would say, rounding all this up uh, in, in New York and the East Coast or whatever, we're not, we're not sometimes the easiest folks to connect with. And uh, you, you doing that with the rest of the team, and I see Caesar and, and everybody, uh, I, I think this KFN thing really sets the standard of where we want to go, and that's why, why Ben and, uh, and Francesca are so supportive, and that's why we've got plans now to expand this and to do something similar uh, in Chicago and in San Francisco. And after that, you know, Martin's got bigger plans. So we got a lot, got a lot, lot, lot going on. So sincerely appreciate it. And by the way, if anybody uh, has any questions or one-on-one -on -one wants to talk about uh, these things, now you know, you know, uh, feel free to send me an email. I, I will call you. It'll be a short call, but I, I, will, I, I, will, I will call everybody who, who sends a message to me. So with that, uh, since you only got 168 hours, get out, get a job, do something. And uh, I wish everybody the best.